when a sick person is tormented by incurable ills, when he himself wishes for death, when pregnancy engenders illness and danger of death, how easily can the thought arise in the soul of the healthy one? Should it not be permitted? Yes, even be one's duty to free that sufferer somewhat earlier from his burden or to sacrifice that life in the womb for the welfare of the mother. As good as such reasoning appears to be, as much as it may be supported by the voice of the heart, yet it is false, and a medical practice founded on it would be in the highest degree wrong and criminal. It well nigh annihilates the very essence of what it means to be a physician. He should and may do nothing other than to sustain life, whether it is happy or unhappy, whether it has value or not, is no concern of his. And if he but once presumes to abandon this one consideration of his profession, the consequences will be incalculable, and the physician will become the most dangerous person in the state. Whatever proportions these crimes finally assumed, it became evident to all who investigated them that they had started from small beginnings. The beginnings at first were merely a subtle shift in emphasis in the basic attitude of the physicians. It started with the acceptance of the attitude, basic in the euthanasia movement, that there is such a thing as a life not worthy to be lived. This attitude in its early stages concerned itself merely with the severely and chronically sick. Gradually, the sphere of those to be included in this category was enlarged to encompass the socially unproductive, the ideologically unwanted, and finally, all non-Aryans. But it is important to realize that the infinitely small wedge-in lever from which this entire trend of mind received its impetus was the attitude towards the non-rehabilitable sick. It is therefore this subtle shift in the emphasis of the physician's attitude that one must thoroughly investigate. Today, the first real memorial for the victims of the Nazis' T4 program will be inaugurated in Brandenburg, Germany. Under Hitler, Brandenburg hosted the first of six major extinction sites established by the Nazis, and during 1940, the site in Brandenburg killed 9,000. The establishment of this memorial couldn't come at a more important moment in living history. The earlier quotation by Dr. Leo Alexander, penned in 1949, came on the heels of the fight against Hitler, the fight for the dignity of human life, the fight which continues to this very moment. For example, Dr. Alexander wrote of a subtle shift which took place back then. In today's French Senate, a bill introduced this past October, pending debate later this month, openly calls for voluntary euthanasia. That's not so subtle. While in Germany, where 65 years ago the cry was never again, not only are they considering the decriminalization of assisted suicide, but there is a strong push for changing the laws on pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where you can predetermine whether or not a life were worthy of living even before they had the chance. On the other side of the channel, in Scotland, the parliament there is acting as our American Senate should, soundly and overwhelmingly rejecting on the first reading a bill permitting assisted suicide. So the fight for civilized human existence is on. Are we, as civilized humanity in the 21st century, morally fit to fight off this global economic collapse, to fight off the hellish collapse in morality which has brought us to this point? As Mr. LaRouche identifies in his recent report, The Global Crisis Now at Hand, it's still an open question, a fight, for which direction the fourth phase of Europe-centered civilization will go. If we, civilized humanity, choose monetarism, willfully choose a dark age as policy, that's exactly what we'll get, a dark age, and what we'll deserve. If, on the other hand, we choose to fight on principle, to fight for the best of civilized humanity's achievements, now, in the same moment in living history, some 220 bodies were discovered at a state hospital cemetery in Hall, Austria. Uh, having been buried between 1942 and 44, these bodies are going to be exhumed and identified. See, thousands were killed in gas chambers in the Linz area under Hitler's rule to end lives deemed unworthy of living. 
Now, it is known that at least 360 patients from the hospital in Hall were sent to their deaths before the T4 euthanasia policy officially ended in August of 41. And with the official end of the policy, a new phase of so-called wild euthanasia, in which victims died from neglect, hunger, drug overdoses, all of this became standard practice. The dam had been breached, and morality had, then, become flooded over with what we would call today end-of-life care, quality-adjusted life years, quantitative easing. Now, after finding these particular graves, some in Austria have attacked President Obama directly, declaring the 1233 decree worse than the euthanasia in the, in the Netherlands, because the 1233 policy were to reward doctors financially for actively pursuing euthanasia. Now, don't let the recent tactical retreat by Obama on 1233 fool you. These jerks are committed to getting the job done by hook or by crook. And that job happens to be the destruction of the very fabric of our republic. It's enough for the doctor to inform the old patient about how his life could become in the event of serious infirmity. And it is not difficult to imagine what the choice of many Americans could be when they are in conditions of fragility and are put under pressure by a government-paid doctor. Knowing that the Republicans, the pro-life movements, and the Catholic world are ready to oppose such a brutal choice, Obama took the end-of-life chapter out of the Medicare bill, hushing up his decision until the eve of its enforcement. Now that the cards are finally on the table, it is terrifying to see the questions a University of Michigan professor has suggested to doctors for discussions with old patients who already have health problems. If you have another heart attack and yours stops, would you like us to start it again? As an emphysema patient, would you like to spend the rest of your life hooked up to a respirator? When the time comes, do you want technology to be used to attempt to delay your death? They call it care, but it looks awfully like euthanasia. If, on the one side, billions have to flow to rescue banks, and on the other side, the money for education and family support is not there or has to be considerably reduced, the question is posed about proportionality. The dignity of man is indivisible from his first moment of existence until natural death. Things have to be addressed by their real name, and euthanasia is murder, the killing of a human being. When Franklin Roosevelt came into office, bank runs had already been ongoing. Many had closed their doors altogether. Much of the nation was destitute, tired, hungry. The people were afraid, were more concerned with scraping together that next meal rather than having anything to do with the general welfare. The people were hoarding their money with the thoughts that just maybe I could protect me and mine, let the other guy worry about himself. That Great Depression was in full swing and the people were thinking not like man, but as beast, survival of the fit. The preconditions for fascism, as an economic policy, as it had already been adopted in Europe to deal with the crisis there, these conditions were here in these United States. As a nation, we, now as then, had a choice. And back then, we chose FDR, and he was up to the task. Now, he was well aware of the foundations of this great nation of ours, and knew that those foundations had to be restored. And, as he laid out in his first inaugural, he knew that the measure of that restoration lay in the extent to which we apply social values more noble than mere monetary profit. Now, the whole of that address is definitely worth a review. Faced by failure of credit, he says, they have proposed only the lending of more money. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? The principles embedded in the preamble of our federal constitution, these principles FDR used to act immediately getting the Emergency Banking Relief Act passed through Congress some five days after his inaugural address, and organizing to get the Glass-Steagall Act voted up a little more than three months after that. Now, I think it's important to emphasize here that that act, though necessary then as now, as exactly as enacted under FDR, is only an expression of a higher principle. 
and expression and implementation of principle as found in the preamble of our federal constitution. Through his work late in life, FDR demonstrated that he knew the true enemy of this nation is empire. From his recognition and commendation of Helen Keller, the likes of whom would be deemed unworthy of life, hell under today's standard, FDR would probably be deemed unworthy of life, from the recognition of her important work to his plans to create a post-war world where, indeed, never again would the road be open to euthanasia as economic policy, Franklin Roosevelt had an unshakable commitment to the good of mankind. As he said in his first inaugural, when there is no vision, the people perish. This vision of FDR, with the same clarity as the greatest figures in the history of our civilization, that is what the empire hates and is out to destroy. From the moment of Roosevelt's untimely death, the means by which we decisively defeated Hitler, the physical means and, what's more important, the moral means, have come under relentless assault. Adolf Hitler's T4 policy, revived today in the name of fiscal responsibility, is aimed at you. Murder, by any means, is murder. While murder against a nation or people is the crime of mass murder. Mass murder, by means of the weapon of hyperinflation, as conducted through the promotion of intrinsically worthless debt, as that is practiced by the Inter-Alpha Group and its confederates, is as much mass murder as any crime of which the Nazis were accused. This morning, Tribunal Number 1 has convened in order to hear statements by the defendants in person. The, mic, the defendants sitting in the first row will make their statements, those who desire to do so, from their places. The Thank you. 